Welcome to Bringing IP to Life. I'm Anna from Amania IP and Amania Design. And I'm joined by my guests to talk about IP. We're going to hear people's stories of their creativity, business and entrepreneurship. Intellectual property can be a really dull subject until it becomes personal. This is aimed to help see the relevance of IP in everyday life. Welcome to the show. So welcome to the IP to Life show. I am joined by Owen Gledel, who runs a business called Merlin, and he serves the leisure industry. So we're going to hear about his journey in building business and in his IP journey as well. And um, if you want to stay for part two of the show, we're going to hear a little bit about what goes on behind the scenes. We're going to hear a little bit of a snippet of the show. So listen in, we're going to hear a little bit about what we're talking about today. Names should be generic. So you, okay. should never, you should never be tied to a name. So I said, okay, what's your business called then? So he said, well, my business is called Sage. I said, oh. all right, okay. I said, well, what does that mean? He says, exactly. It can be anything I want it to be. So Owen is in a busy working business. So if you hear people in the background, it's because he's at work. So this is what we're listening to. But welcome, Owen. Lovely to have you on the show. Thank you. Good to be here. Yes. So, Owen, let's just hear a little bit about, tell us succinctly what you do and um, how you serve the leisure industry. Uh, well, predominantly we provide uh, access, control, ticketing, memberships, services for visitor attractions, venues and events. Effectively, in simple terms, you provide the experience, we manage the people. And so you do this for all over the UK, don't you? We do it all over the UK. We do it. We've also got clients in Africa and the Middle East. So you're not limited by geography? Not at all, no, no, no. We're only limited predominantly by language, actually. We tend right. to serve English-speaking countries and or territories. We're going to hear a little snippet of Owen talking to somebody at a trade show and where he's explaining about the business and talking about his main competitor and how they can do things differently. Owen, uh, you told me your business is about people. Yeah, we manage people wherever they need to go, whether it's a venue, an event, a festival, visitor attraction, a restaurant, a sports stadium, anywhere where people need managing, ticketing and booking. And how do you manage them then? What, what? The software manages them. So we have a platform uh, which is uh, available to be used by anybody who wants to organize an event, take bookings and issue tickets. There's a leading player in our market, and that's an, an organization called Eventbrite. And, and they're well known, and they're a huge American multi-billion dollar corporation. And we compete directly with them. I think the surprising thing is that we can compete directly with them and in fact offer something better both in terms of functionality and of value. So if someone is, is considering that, someone's considering using Eventbrite or using yourself, what is, what is the extra value? Predominantly there are probably four key things. The first thing is if you put an event on Eventbrite, it's not your event, it belongs to Eventbrite and it sits on their website. The second thing is that any data that you collect for that event doesn't belong to you, it belongs to Eventbrite and under GDPR you can't use it. The third thing is that if you put it on Eventbrite's website it uses all their branding. With our system, it's all your branding, all your corporate identity, and it sits on your website. And fourthly, if you use Eventbrite, it's 15%. If you use Merlin, it's three. So, Owen, we met a few years ago now at a networking event, and uh, you've been one of my business mentors along the way, challenged me with quite a few things in my business journey. <laughs> and um, 
you shared with me about some issues you'd had with um, securing your trademark. So we're going to hear a little bit about that in a little bit. But first, I'd like to hear a little bit about the business journey. What took you to building Merlin right in the first place? Oh, well, I, I, I came from a family business. So my family had been in business over generations, predominantly in the transport business. So my father, he, he had cars and coaches and his brother had lorries and, and uh, coal deliveries and all that sort of stuff. So I was brought up in, in that industry. So I knew all about how you had to work hard to make things happen and how it re relied on you to do it and not on others and all that sort of stuff, which people now call entrepreneurism, but right. I'm not quite sure that we had, my French was good enough in those days to even <laughs> pronounce it, let alone understand what it was. But yes. uh, my, I, I left school uh, at 16 and joined the RAF right. uh, as a boy entrant and then realised that I should have stayed at school and got some qualifications, so I then had to work a lot harder whilst holding down effectively a, a job and training to be a an electronics technician and passing my exams at all at the same time. Wow. Uh, but I also found a real business opportunity because we we were treated very very poorly, I guess, as as young sixteen year olds. Right. Uh, and, and and everything we had was 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 very, very minimal. So we had a very minimal allowance. Uh, and we were paid fortnightly with a, a very minimal allowance during the course of the term. And that was fine for those of us who could live on a fairly limited income. Right. Uh, but for those people that smoked, it was quite a difficult thing because <laughs> there wasn't enough money in the kitty to right. pay for everything else and buy cigarettes that would last two weeks. Okay. So okay. I, I came across the opportunity to supply cigarettes to those that needed them <laughs> because of their addiction. <laughs> oh, I see. Gosh, really, Owen? <laughs> I went out and invested in a, in a, in a packet of 200 uh, Park Drive cigarettes. Oh, and I, used, I used to then, uh, I started off by loaning them out. So you, you got one from me for two back. Uh, right. And, and, and that, that was all right at first, but then people didn't have any, any to give me back. And if, I get, if they gave me two back, they were already two down. And, and so I then started to sell them instead of, uh, <laughs> instead of doing that. And, and, and that, that didn't work out too well because they didn't have the money to, right. to pay me. So what I started to do, I, I, I created accounts for all the smokers and they used to get cigarettes on tick. And I used to keep a record of all their owings. And then at the end of each semester, we used to get paid the money that they'd kept back from us during the course of that particular term in wow. order that we'd have something to come home on leave with and be able to spend when we got home. And I used to collect my, my, my monies at the end of each semester. So, <laughs> so we, would, we would march in and, and uh, give our number, rank and name and get our, our, our money. And then I had a table at the back and I had my little book and I would get paid as you walked out. And at the, end, at the end of my two years in college with the REF, I walked into Thompson's and Doncaster and bought a car for cash. Wow. Wow. So this is the hidden past that most people don't know about. <laughs> That's right. That's how I started. Oh, I didn't know that about you, Owen. Uh, wow. so that, was my, that was my first business. Selling cigarettes illegally, uh, with, <laughs> with with I have to say the the acquiescence of the RAF because not only did they allow me to do it, but they also allowed me to have a little table at the back uh, <laughs> to make sure I got paid. Gosh, how funny! How funny! So tell us what happened in between because obviously you started there with your dodgy business. Yes, well, I I I. I I continued uh, in the area for a number of years. I was I was posted out to the Far East, and I served in the in the Malay campaign uh, right. with the RAF. I served with the uh, I was I was seconded to the First Royal New Zealand Infantry Regiment, the Kiwis, for a while, and yes. then I was seconded to the Gurkhas, and I spent some time with the Forty Fifth Gurkha Rifles, 
uh, right. doing, vari doing various bits and pieces. But I also realized that people a long way away from home and wives, girlfriends and family uh, needed to be in contact with them. So I went out and bought some camera equipment and some studio equipment and started doing photographs for people to send home. Oh. Uh, so I had a little business running there with my little photographic studio. <laughs> so entrepreneurship is in your blood. <laughs> wow. wow. So, so that kept me going there. So then when I came back from there, I was able to buy another car for cash. Mm -hmm. This time it was a brand new one. The first one wasn't brand new, but this time it was a brand new one. Okay. Okay. So what happened next and at what stage did you get into doing your own business? Well, I, I left I left the RAF and went back into the family business because my father wanted me to get involved with the family business. So I went into the family business for a while. Uh, it wasn't really what I wanted to do. And, and Dad and I weren't weren't really good business fellows. Uh, right. His, his, his idea of business was far too, far too old fashioned and safe for me. Right. Uh, I wanted to be doing things and making things happen. And he wanted everything to be exactly as it should be and everything, all the I's dotted and the T's crossed. And that wasn't my way of doing things. So, so I left and, and went, I went back working for the RAF for a while, actually. Right. Uh, as a civilian, helping them develop some of their new uh, electronic uh, air traffic control systems. Okay. Uh, and, and then... Then from there, uh, actually, I <clears throat> I moved from there into uh, printing. Okay. Uh, developing uh, electronic printing systems, converting the old hot metal stuff uh, that used to be used for producing uh, publications, newspapers, magazines, etc., to be right. able to use photo typesetting. So I was instrumental in developing the first photo typesetting systems. Uh, and then, then oh. from there, I moved into retailing, using uh, laser scanning for uh, barcode reading at the point of sale, and okay. developed the very first systems for that in the UK, uh, for people like Sainsbury's and uh, Hillard's, before they became Tesco and Morrison's and people like that. And it was from there that I then went off on my own because I realized that whilst all the big boys had access to this technology because they, they had the infrastructure, they had the, the wherewithal and everything else to manage it, they, the smaller independent retailers didn't have access to this technology because they couldn't afford it. Right. Uh, and just at around that time, uh, IBM brought out its own computer called the IBM PC, okay. uh, which, which was a big box. Uh, with a monitor and a keyboard and, and, and some software that you could use to uh, put programs on, uh, very early, early programs. But you could also put your own programs on it. So I developed software for independent retail and tried to use the IBM PC as a platform for that. It, it wasn't really up to it. It wasn't powerful enough. Uh, so... For a couple of years, I was I was doing some consultancy work while I was still developing the software, and then when IBM brought out its big brother uh, to the PC, uh, which had more power, more more memory, more capability, I was then able to put my software on that and then start selling retail systems out to the small independent multi-branch retailers, which was my market. Wow. Wow. So is that the beginning of Merlin? Is that how that started? Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, it wasn't called Merlin in, it, in its early days. Merlin came about as a result of, of changes in the business. When, it, when we first started, the business was called Retail Manager because that's what we did. We managed retail for people. However, what, what happened from there was that uh, I got involved with an organization called the Business Accounting Software Developers Association. And th the problem that we had as software developers was that, and this links in very much into your IP scenario, is that we had no protection. Right. Uh, there was, there was uh, you know, the, obviously the, the publications and, 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 and uh, copyright act and things like that, but software wasn't included. Right. And so we were, and at the time, 
software was was becoming quite popular because it was a new thing. And so people were, were copying software left, right and centre and we had no protection. We weren't, you know, we weren't covered by the Copyright Designs and Patents Act at all. Uh, that was predominantly for printed material and not for software. So we formed the Business Accounting and Software Developers Association to allow us to have uh, IP protection for our product. Right. Uh, and I was one of the founder members of that. And I was we, we, we formed it actually one day down in the director's uh, club down in, in Pall Mall in London. And we'd, we'd done all the basic heads of terms and, and, and basic uh, structure of the organisation. And then we went for lunch and, and I was sat next door to a guy who, who'd been in the meeting with me earlier. And we got chatting and he said, and, and what's your business called? So I said, retail manager. So he said, oh, he said, you do retail systems then? So I said, yeah, that's what we do. He said, you don't do wholesale systems then? I said, well, yeah, of course we do. I said, wholesale is just retailing without the VAT. Right. <laughs> I said, VAT's an add-on in wholesaling where it's, in, it's in, integrated in retailing. I said, everything else is pretty much the same. So he said, well, why isn't it called wholesale manager then? Okay. So I said, uh I said, well, because our biggest client base is retail. So he said, well, yeah, he said, but he said, you'll regret that. So oh. I said, okay. He said, you know, he said, names should be generic. So okay. you, should never, you should never be tied to a name. So I said, okay, what's your business called then? So he said, well, my business is called Sage. I oh. said, all right, okay. I said, well, what does that mean? He says, exactly. It can be anything I want it to be, right? And at okay. the time, it was it was it was the Sage Accounting System, very much in its infancy, and that was David Goldman, the original founder of Sage. Interesting. How so he said, he said, you did give some thought to that. So a, a few years later, when Windows uh, became the prevalent operating system, and and we we all had to make changes to to operate on Windows. We decided that the, the business perhaps with a new version needed a new name okay. for the product. The product at least needed a new name. So we looked around for a name for the product. And we, we had various names plastered on the walls in the office and people were, were giving their opinions on them. Uh, and at the same time, we were clearing out an old filing cabinet of some stuff that we'd had in uh, for a number of years. And we'd, we'd done some work for an organization in London who supplied retail terminals right? Uh, and, and we'd written some software for them and their terminal was called the Merlin Terminal. Okay. Uh, um, and these brochures were in the, uh, were in the filing cabinets and, and one of the people in the office says, well, why don't we call it Merlin? We've already used Merlin once some years ago. Why don't we go back to that? Okay. So we decided we would, we would use the name Merlin. Everybody in the in the office seemed to think that was a great idea because it can be an it, it can be a he, it, it can be anything you want it to be. So yes. and going back going back to David Goldman's comments all those years earlier, it, it strung it struck a chord with me that there was a name not dissimilar to Sage that could be anything you wanted it to be. So yeah. that's that's how Merlin came about. So then we we we, we changed our name to Merlin. Uh, or at least we changed the software to Merlin. We didn't change the company name at that time, but we changed the we changed the uh, the software to to be called Merlin. We we changed the company name sometime later, uh, but the, our software was Merlin. Uh, and, and then, of course, then we 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 then had a battle to uh, to to be able to, to be in a position to uh, to protect that with by by a trademark, uh, and that. Uh, that proved to be a little more difficult, but we got there in the end. Ah, we're going to come back to that in a minute, Owen. So you talked, Owen, about the um, you not being able to, to cover your um, the protection with the software. Now, I understand that the Copyrights Act does cover software, but there were changes. There were different. It was different when you started. Is that correct? Yeah, it's been updated several times in in the right. last sort of twenty years, thirty years. Bearing in mind we've been in business now forty years. Right. The law has had to catch up with uh, what's been going on in industry. Oh yeah, well, law does that, doesn't it? Yeah, 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 
Yeah, so let's go back to the story behind your trademark, because that was has been a bit of a um, an interesting story. So tell us what happened when you decided to call your software Merlin, but then decided to go down the trademark route. Talk to us about that. Well, the, Mer Merlin was actually, the, the name Merlin was owned by uh, British Telecom. And they developed a telephone system uh, back in the early 60s mm -hmm. called the Merlin Telephone System. Right. So when we started using the name Merlin uh, for a, a technical product, uh, they got a little bit jumpy about it and wanted to know more about what we were doing. And I actually had a meeting with, with their patent people down in Euston Road in London. Right. And uh, we we sat down and discussed and they, they wanted Merlin for telecommunications. That was that was what class they wanted Merlin in. Right. So we we came up with a a a set of words that would meet ours and their requirements so that we had the rights to Merlin software for right. use in retail and wholesale applications. And they kept the name Merlin for use in telecommunications and associated industries. So we, 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 managed, our, we, we managed to agree with them that we would use those, uh, that, that wording in our trademark application. And on that basis, they allowed us to, to make an application to uh, the, the body to get a trademark for Merlin. And <clears throat> It was interesting, actually, because we were challenged uh, by the National Lottery uh, right. because they said, well, it contravenes our trademark for Merlin the gaming machine. Right. So we, we were quite miffed by that because they were already uh, under sub-license from British Telecom, uh, as, as effectively we were. Uh, so... I went back to British Telecom and said, well, how come uh, the National Lottery are complaining when, you know, you guys who own it have not complained at all? And they said, oh, well, OK, well, leave that with us and we'll get that sorted. <laughs> so they, they put their patent lawyers on to uh, the, the National Lottery people and, right. and eventually they withdrew their objection. Uh, it, took, it took a couple of years or so for that to happen, but going backwards and forwards, backwards and forwards, and incurring costs here, there, and everywhere, as patent lawyers do. Uh, wow. But eventually, they backed off, and, and we, got the, we got it approved. Wow. Wow. So We've had battles with it ever since, because people keep trying to use Merlin for other things, not least of which was Merlin Entertainment's group, who effectively work in the same industry as we do. Right. Yes. Uh, and we had to battle them in the early days. Oh, interesting. <laughs> interesting. So, Owen, did you go for any other forms of, um, I mean, you were talking about patents. Have you got patents in your business as well? No, we don't have any patents because, I mean, we, we've developed some interesting uh, hardware solutions over the years, which were quite unique in their own right. But having said that, we've never, uh, we've never looked to get patents on them. For, for, for two main reasons. One, because of the, the significant cost of a patent. Yes. And, and secondly, to, to really get yourself protection, you've got to have your patent in virtually every country in the world, otherwise it's not secure. Right. Because if you haven't, if you haven't got it in Bangladesh, but you have got it in somewhere else, and yes. they decide to copy it in Bangladesh, there's absolutely nothing you can do. Mm. So it's, it, patents are... They're okay if you've genuinely got something that's absolutely totally unique. Well, we didn't. It was the first. It was the first of of its kind, but it right. wasn't totally unique. Right. I mean, for example, we designed and built the very first touchscreen for retail. Wow, wow! But it wasn't unique because the component parts of it we bought in. Okay. Okay. So you've relied on trademarking as your form of IP to build the business. That's we have, yeah. 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 So in that journey of having all those bumps and <laughs> conflicts, <laughs> I suppose with a name like Merlin, which is a very, you know, usable, recognizable name, 
I suppose that kind of thing will continue to happen, won't it? You getting challenges about? Oh yeah, I got I got a letter uh, only a few weeks ago from the uh, intellectual property office about somebody that's uh, right trying to use it. Yes, yes. And what do you do when that happens? Do you ever do challenge do you ever, it? You do challenge it always. Yeah. If they're in a different area, or do, is it? Does it? Vary? It depends. It depends what they're doing with it. If if they're in a, if anything associated with what we're doing, yes, then we challenge it. If it, I mean, if they want to have Merlin dog food, then we wouldn't challenge that. Right. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's totally irrelevant to us. So yeah. So if if it's if it's relevant, but invariably, if it's not relevant, you don't get a letter. No. Uh, the, the office will only send you a letter if they think there's, there's, it's a potential issue. Because yes, obviously I... there's costs involved. As soon as you get involved in this, it's, mm. you know, the, the initial fee is £100, then it's £500, and you're into £600 before you've even kicked off. Yes. Yeah, because I've, I've had some correspondence with them about asking if they want to challenge other names, but they've all been slightly different to mine and in different fields. But so... What's been the process when you have challenged them? How's that worked? Oh, we've always won. Yeah, but what, what's been the process? You've been corresponding with the intellectual property office. Is that how, how you've done it? Well, invariably, I mean, I use a, I use a patent lawyer and put them on and, and let them sort it out. I don't I don't get involved myself. Right. Yes. I mean, the. the, the there are too many nuances associated with it that, you know, if you're not careful, you can miss something quite easily. So I tend to leave it to the experts. Yeah. <laughs> and then and then when we win, I just claim all my costs back. Oh, very good. Very good. Have you won them all? All the ones yes. you've challenged? Yes, yes. Mm. How, many, how many challenges have you had? Oh, I don't know. Uh, three... Three really big ones, I think, where where one of them actually said to me, "Well, you've got no chance. We've got deeper pockets than yours." And I said to the guy, "Yeah, but the law's on our side." Yeah. Uh, yes. And yeah. deep pockets didn't get him there. <laughs> the law did. That's good. That's good. And I thought it was quite. I mean, we had one that we it went and went and went, and then we we literally coming up the steps to the court when they agreed to capitulate. Wow, yeah. Well, it's an expensive road, isn't it? If you want to. Oh, it's very, very. I mean, one of one of them. I mean, it co it cost us, I think, about fourteen thousand pounds. Wow. And wow. then they they and that's the one that capitulated. So because we didn't go to court, we couldn't claim co costs back. Oh right, okay. They knew what they were doing. They were just running us up, running a bill up for us. Wow. If you'd like to know more about intellectual property or IP, check out the Amania IP website at www.amaniaipcourses.com. Courses vary from general basic understanding about IP for adults, young people and students, through to professional courses and courses for the USA market. The courses are aimed to help young people, students, designers, artists, business owners and entrepreneurs become IP smart to enable them to protect their dreams. So Owen, you've got so many gems to share with us today. We're going to split this part of the show into two parts because there's too much here for um, one show. So Come back and listen to the other parts of the story where Owen talks about the business development and how he's made it all work. Thanks for joining us on the show. Like, follow and subscribe to make sure you hear about what's coming up next. You can head over to the website www.amaniaipcourses.com to find out more. See you again soon.